Good morning, my name is Anthony Macrowood, the Archdeacon of Dorset, and I'm delighted to be able to join you this morning for worship. Now, several years ago, when I was on sabbatical, I stood in front of the Areopagus, where Paul had stood, and listened to the words we heard this morning. Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. Now, by St Paul's time, Athens had lost its political power and was part of the Roman Empire, but the whole hillside centred on the Areopagus was renowned throughout the ancient world as a seat of learning, a university in which philosophy was the principal discipline. The Parthenon, that famous temple we see in the pictures of Athens, stood on top of this hill. We know the location of Paul's encounter almost exactly because from the 7th century BC, the Council of the Areopagus, a court of 30 men, met in the Stoa Basilios at the foot of the hill to hear murder trials, and later they dealt with crimes and religious disputes. Paul was probably asked to explain this new God, Jesus, and what he meant by resurrection. It was likely to have been a crowd of learned people who gathered at this spot to debate the latest ideas, and Paul's ideas would certainly have been strange to the Athenians. Today, the location is marked by a bronze plinth engraved with the passage we heard. We may, we may think ourselves to be so much more advanced and sophisticated than those who stood listening to Paul, but COVID-19 has rather shattered our sense of being masters of the universe. Our whole way of life has been brought to a shattering halt by a virus in which in much the same way as plague did to societies in the past. But in many ways, our sense of superiority in all this is misplaced. My trip around the ancient world in the footsteps of St Paul made me realise just how sophisticated the ancient world was. The Romans had complex cities with running water piped to houses, proper sewers, street lighting, beautiful architecture. London did not achieve a water and sewerage system as effective as that left by the Romans until the latter half of the 19th century. Medical knowledge too didn't surpass that practised by ancient Greek doctors until the mid to late 19th century. Living standards in the central parts of the empire were high compared with developing countries today. Food was generally plentiful, houses had a form of central heating, and for long periods under Pax Romana, ordinary people knew peace even if the tax regime and government could be oppressive. Life as a slave was not so good, but for many, better than your average factory worker in 19th century Britain. It was also a very cosmopolitan world. People of many races were found in Roman cities, helped by the Roman pattern of using troops raised from one part of the empire to police another. Roman modes also made communications easier than at any time until the arrival of the railways. Adherence to ancient religions was diminishing. Then as now, people who are well fed, clothed and warm, and for whom life is easy and predictable, tend to be less aware of their need of God. Sexual morality was libertine, with cities like Corinth having a reputation across the ancient world for particular licentiousness. And we need to remember that when we read Paul's letters to the church in Corinth. There was an emphasis on personal fitness with public gymnasia and public baths functioning very like our fitness clubs today. Then, as now, much popular religion and spirituality was paganistic and concerned with self-fulfilment rather than notions of enduring hardship and self-sacrifice for the sake of others, which is such a feature of Christianity. Christianity burst upon the Roman world with extraordinary vitality, with St Paul right at the heart of it. So what can we learn from his encounter in Athens? Firstly, his courage and bravery. He was not afraid to go into the lion's den and preach to possibly the toughest group of sceptics he was ever likely to encounter, because the Athenians loved ideas. They loved playing with them and those who espoused them. Preaching to the philosophers of Athens would be like taking on the high table at an Oxbridge college. And make no mistake, he often described preaching Christ crucified and risen as foolishness to the Gentiles. And crucifixion was the means of executing political prisoners, for heaven's sake, and resurrection from the dead would be regarded as sheer nonsense. So he 
was not starting with promising material, but he had confidence in God. In human terms, his message might have had little to recommend it, but Paul was confident in God and knew the truth of it in his own experience. His was a lived faith. He had experienced the risen Lord. He had experienced God's power to heal and save. So he was able to be confident in God. And if we wish to be confident in sharing our faith, we too need to be open to experiencing the risen Christ in our lives. Now, secondly, Paul did his homework. He had found out the best place to go in Athens to make maximum impact and he had researched his audience. Legend has it that as in an attempt to stop plague in Athens in 600 BC, sheep were released onto the Areopagus. Each was then sacrificed to the god nearest to whose shrine it laid down. If there was a, no temple nearby, a new altar was erected on the spot to an unknown god. Now, I'm not sure I'd recommend that as a way of stopping plague today. But Paul uses his, this first to compliment his audience on their innate religious nature. Then he addressed them, showing his knowledge of the two dominant streams of thought in ancient philosophy, the Epicureans and the Stoics. Now, Epicureans taught that everything happens by chance. The gods are too remote to be interested in us. And death is the end of everything, so we should devote ourselves to seeking happiness. Though before you all decide to go and be Epicureans, you ought to bear in mind that being ancient Greeks, this happiness was to be intellectual, not sensual. Paul refers to the God who ordered the creation into being as, as being not far from each of us. So telling us that what he thinks of that philosophy. The Stoics, on the other hand, taught that everything is a part of God, so everything happens because it is fated to. The cycle of history ends in flames and begins again, so we should bear our suffering bravely, hence our phrase about being stoical. Paul quotes Stoic thought when he says, in him we live and move and have our being. But in calling them to repent, he's suggesting there is something they can do to alter their eternal fate. Paul then was brave had confidence in God and had researched his audience. The end of the passage tells us a, a few people were converted and others wanted to know more. You might think that that was a disappointing response, but we're not told Paul was disappointed no, because he was realistic about the outcome he expected. In Athens, he did not expect vast numbers to turn to Christ as a result of his preaching. They were too hard bitten, too used to banding around ideas but some listened, and with that nucleus, he was able to build a church in Athens. Now, to draw these thoughts together, as we look at our culture and society, we see it is increasingly coming to resemble the ancient world. A cocktail of competing ideas, a fluid cosmopolitan society, a comfortable world in which many people indulge their every passion with no thought for their eternal future. But equally, a world and society that has received a profound shock in COVID-19, reminding us that we're not masters of the universe and life is rather more precarious than we thought. The public service and sacrificial attitude displayed by NHS and care home workers has been inspiring. A few weeks ago, prayer was topping the list of searches on Google and churches up and down the land are reporting many more people participating in online services and might darken at the door of a church building on Sunday. This week, a Comrades poll found 24% of adults have watched or listened to a religious service since lockdown. And amongst 18 to 34 year olds, the figure is 34%. So maybe the soil is more fertile than we realise. Just as Christianity transformed the ancient world, so it can offer hope to our post-19 world. COVID-19 world. So how and what are we going to do differently when this crisis ends? What have we learned as a church and how are we going to capitalise on this renewed interest in things spiritual? Well, like St Paul, we will need to be brave, confident in God, do our homework about those we're trying to reach and be realistic about the outcome. Making disciples is a slow business. It is a journey and one on which we are all fellow travellers. Amen. <laughs>